Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 5th of April 2024. Let's get to where we normally start, the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply and you can find them in the description to the video below. Now, there are some phenomenal figures in the in this loss list today quite incredible uh we'll start with 860 personnel that's fairly high as in it's higher than we've seen it for the last probably four days or so uh, but not over the thousand mark but still a significant loss of personnel right 15 tanks is a pretty high number of tanks to lose in a day uh that's gonna hurt 73 armored personnel vehicles is absolutely of phenomenal and then 50 artillery pieces both of those categories are posting huge numbers although it's not the highest number we've had over the war you can see from Dell's data analysis here that there was a, a moment at the beginning of the war April 2022 and then two absolutely insane days in October last year that was when Russia were attacking in Avdivka with massive columns and we're just getting absolutely hammered. But this one today is the fourth largest. It's just around there. That's in terms of APV losses. If we go back then and see that uh, there are 50 artillery systems, let's go and see where that sits. That's a large amount, but it's not the largest. There have been uh, a day where there was 66, uh, 61, a number well into the 50s there. Uh, but it's up there. It, it, it is a high loss day, that is for sure. Uh, and then we have three multiple launch rocket systems, one anti-aircraft warfare system, 61 vehicles and fuel tanks, and four pieces of special equipment. Let's go and look at the special, uh, not uh, vehicles and fuel tanks, sorry. So 61 loss, uh, lost. Again, that, that's not the highest, not by long shot, but it is up there amongst the higher echelons of these losses. There was a time in when was that in March where they lost an absolute ton of uh, of other sorts of equipment, vehicles, and fuel tanks and whatnot. But this is a significantly bad day for the Russians in terms of a lot of the uh, the categories that we that we talk about. It's just yeah, really really big losses. What does that suggest? Well, it suggests that the Russians are still attacking in a big way uh, and they are losing lots of vehicles in so doing. That these attacks are making marginal gains, it appears, on the front line. And indeed, Zelensky has come out and said the front line is stabilised. That's huge news. You can argue whether that's strictly true or not. But it has calmed down. It's not like Avdivka was a month ago uh, and the Russians making larger advances. This is... This is grinding gains for uh, the Russians, and those gains come at a, a massive cost. It really, they really do, and I, I don't know how sustainable. Well, it's not sustainable. These kind of figures, if they're even remotely true, are simply not sustainable. We go to Andrew Perpetua's lost stats, and remember, these statistics will have a one to two day lag, sometimes more, on what the general staff posts. So when the general staff posts, say, 73 armored personnel vehicles lost because yesterday was insane, um, the the visually conf visual confirmation of at least some of those uh, losses will take a, a bit of time to filter through the socials. So this is probably referring to yesterday and the day before's stats uh, from Andrew Perpetua, the visually confirmed losses on the socials. And remember, if you go to his original post for this, it will have the the losses on a, a spreadsheet and you can look at the URLs for each of these losses, the um, internet addresses for each of these losses. Right, then we look, well, first of all, we look at the ratios. That's about three and a half to one possibly. So not as good ratio as we've seen the last two days, but that's still a great ratio and exactly what they'd like to maintain uh, in order to prevail in the, in the war in general. They need at least a three to one advantage. I think um, a couple of Bradleys on there, one abandoned, one damaged, that's going to hurt. They, they do use the Bradleys fairly actively, particularly around the Abdivka front line. So you are going to expect to, then to lose these Bradleys and get them damaged, especially since it's so difficult to use any equipment and have it 
get out unscathed. The amount of drones flying around. Like, I, this is a problem about the Ukrainians going on an attack at whenever the Ukrainians are, are planning to attack, right? It is they have to contend with a massive um, bombardment of first-person view drones and Lancet drones and all sorts. What, and there, there's just a very high probability that, you know, e even forgetting the potency of artillery barrages, uh, you're just going to expect to lose all sorts of equipment if you attack. And I think the Russians are experiencing this every single day they attack. But they don't have any other option because if you want to take ground, you've got to move forward. And this is why the the Russians have been using the aviation so widely. And we'll come on to this a, a little bit later because the, the claim has been that the Ukraine has got nothing they can do about the Russian aviation bomb bombing raids with um, guided glide bombs. Of course, there is something you can do about it. There are several things you can do about it. But it's just they've been less able to do something about that as they can about the the attacks on the ground with infantry and vehicles. This whole scenario leads one to think that the the war is going to be somewhat positional unless unless you get air advantage and you can absolutely hammer the front lines and then move your troops forward or unless you get some kind of really significant technological advantage where you can take out all the use of drones in any given area and push forward with your troops so this is why it's so important to take out artillery and they've been doing that for a long time the ukrainians however the russians have a huge stock of artillery and they can keep replacing those massive losses they take the question is how long can that go on for and at some point will they start really feeling that lack of artillery then you would need to take out using electronic warfare if this is even at all possible every use of drones uh, at, at the same time as you you are hammering the front lines with huge aviation barrages given some kind of aviation advantage or superiority that you can garner and once you've done that, then you move forward. It's a bit like the Russians did at the beginning of the war, which is flatten a place, then move into it and stick a flag down. Like That's how either side has to do it, because until you do that, any movement of troops and trucks of tanks and IFVs is going to be absolutely hammered by drones. This has become a drone war. Uh, even, you know, Ukrainians here have lost a number of pieces of kit, some APCs, uh, some Max Pro and a QP, that's the Hedgehog, the Turkish provided uh, mine resistant ambush protection vehicle um, taken out there. Uh, a number of vehicles here, a couple of fire engines thrown in at the end there, that, that was in Kharkiv. Um, but yeah, the, these, these attacks, I mean, we go into the Russian losses, just all they do is they, they bring about significant Russian losses. And what's important to note here is when you look at the Russian losses from yesterday, the amount of destroyed vehicles in the brown is is overwhelming. Um, so, yeah, a really bad day at the office for the Russians. Losing, OK, a couple of bits of artillery. We see less footage of that. Uh, but the T-80 tanks and, and other tanks taken out, large number of tanks, and then another huge loss, loss in terms of uh, infantry fighting vehicles, BMPs, BMDs, a uh, couple of APCs, some Tiger M's, a uh, whole swathe of uh, trucks and civilian vehicles. And just, just you add that mass of equipment up and it's just hugely unsustainable. No really high value equipment on either side there, sort of radars, air defense systems and whatnot. Although the claims are have been uh, consistent this week that, the, that there have been one or two air defense systems lost each day for the Russians. We haven't seen the visual confirmation of those. Andrew Perpetua then adds in, uh, in you know, light of the fact that he and his team compile this data, he also says there are major map updates today, so this is to his mapping side, like a dozen losses we never logged for some reason north of Novomokhalivka. So we are seeing all this footage coming out from places like Novomokhalivka, Avdivka, Terny, where the Russians are attacking with large columns and then getting repelled and losing huge amounts of kit. But as I've mentioned before, Andrew occasionally gets high resolution data or high resolution imagery from the satellites. And when he does, he like picks up more losses than were previously recognized or suddenly sees footage from a different direction from video footage or satellite imagery of a slightly different place or whatever. And then suddenly there's a load more. 
So he says, a dozen losses we'd never logged for some reason, north of Novomokhalivka. I haven't counted in a while, but we're up to like 200 vehicles there by now. Just insane numbers of vehicle and vehicles. And often when you see these, like these dots that he puts on a map, they're not always just one vehicle. Sometimes they're two or three vehicles that are right next to each other. Um, so yeah, it's it's incredi incredible. Incredible. Um, yeah, and uh, so here we go. I counted the Russian losses in Novomikolivka and that we have, and it is 267. And we're missing a lot too, like a lot, he says. So 267 Russian vehicle losses around one town. And he recognizes they're missing a lot. Like they just saw something from a different angle and found another 20. The numbers are staggering. And so you go back to this and say, well, are the general staff like talking nonsense or are they generally correct? And I keep concluding that they are generally correct. They are in the ballpark. And there's, there's a criteria. Uh, there are criteria that the, the troops have to use, the units have to use in order to submit this data to the general staff. And it's not just putting numbers out there posterior. I think the most likely that that will occur is with the personnel. Where it's a little bit, there's a lot more guesstimation, as I keep saying. Right, moving on. Another Russian column has tried to approach Novomikhailivka again. So we've got the video evidence of this uh, from the north. And they got countered by Ukrainian artillery. So this is significant because we're starting to seeing artillery play a large part in the way that Ukraine defend. We were missing that for a good month or two. And as a result, Abdivka was lost. But now they're starting to use it again. Uh, those who got through were unlucky in the end. So it's just another bit of footage of a lot of Russian equipment getting destroyed. You can see it. Most of these should be, unless sometimes I, I miss a few out, but most of these should be linked on the video to, below because I can't often show you this stuff uh, get in trouble. Um, another attack, this time in Bakhmut, repelling Russian attack on the Bakhmut front. Uh, the attack was today, so this is yesterday. Ukrainian source wrote about this attack as follows. Quote, today in the direction of Bakhmut, the enemy tried to carry out a massive mechanized assault using about 25 AFVs. Half were destroyed, the other half retreated we are cleaning up the infantry. The guys did an incredibly hard job. Also, according to OSINT UA, 11 out of 25 Russian AFVs were lost during the attack. So somewhere around, literally half of those were destroyed, according to both open source and the claims of the Ukrainians themselves. So this is where open source confirms the Russian general staff, or at least the unit claims. And again, we get to this conclusion that the Ukrainian claims are at least largely accurate. And the, the, the imagery just doesn't stop. It's absolutely insane uh, at the moment. So that was Novomikhailivka. We've got Bakhmut. We've got uh, a bit of video evidence here. Um, I can't really show you any of the video because it's deeply inappropriate in terms of dead bodies and whatnot. But Anton Gerashchenko shares this, uh, and the quote from the Russian who's speaking on the video says, this is how people died. Here, all our equipment was destroyed. Dead people lie everywhere. It's scary, guys. Very scary. This is what's left of him. There's a thigh. There's another one. They burned it. It's scary. The video, of course, you've got to remember these are, the, these are people, but this is war. And what, what you have, what you don't have is video like the, like this one and videos like one I'm going to show you or reference in a minute being shown to Russian soldiers before they sign up. Instead, what you get is an incredible amount of disinformation. So we know that the Russians often don't surrender, even though you know they should. Any sane person would surrender in that position unless they had an idea in their heads that was more powerful than surrendering. And what the Russians tell their, their troops is that if you ever surrender, the Ukrainians will torture the hell out of you and then kill you. It will be horrific. And we keep hearing this from people who do actually eventually get captured as POWs, who then say, say things like, oh, I thought I was going to be majorly tortured and this and that and all sorts. And the reality is that the, the Russians are disinformed so much that they, they end up, and it works, right? Because the Russians don't want their troops to surrender. They want them to keep going until death. Um, but it, it's, you know, worst case scenario is that they start surrendering and then you get a malaise of morale in your units as people start surrendering. So they do something about that and scare people 
to the point where surrender is the very last thing they opt to do. Uh, the video was filmed by one of the contract soldiers of the Russian army who came to fight in Ukraine from the city of Cheboksary, the capital of Chuvash Republic in Russia. To the sound of gunfire against the backdrop of burnt equipment and the corpses of his comrades, he tells in Chuvashian and Russian about how they are being sent to their slaughter. Uh, quite incredible there. Um, and then we've got another uh, bit of footage here. This is... This is a uh, this is a difficult watch for me actually. This is even this is possibly this is more difficult for me to watch than say seeing dead bodies, right? So this is a Ukrainian SSO unit targeting Russian infantry. Uh, since the emergence of FPV drones, the chance of survival at the front, especially for Russian troops of, on the offensive, is very low. In this clip, it is almost as if a game is being played with Russian soldiers just before they charge into them, knowing that he will be here anyway. If not with his FPV, then with the next one. Um, what we see on this montage are people either out in the open with a drone trying to run in circles to get away from drones, tripping over the drone getting them, or eventually the drone is just getting them anyway. There's no way you can hide. Or they're around like half-destroyed vehicles or destroyed vehicles, running around a vehicle or hiding under bits of metal, and then the drone, you, there's no escape. And what's really difficult about watching stuff like this is the art uh, that it's like a greek tragedy you know this is going to end horribly you are going to die and that's just absolutely horrible for any human being to see a human being be chased around and then killed inevitably killed it seems is really difficult but that's the reality for for the troops and this will be the same for both sides drones are horrific in this but they are horrifically effective and they are such an important component of of this war i mean i, I was taught i'm hopefully going to uh, speak to uh, daniela again from tochny who's saying he's got a um a bombshell he says a bombshell of an article coming out uh and uh I'm interested to see what is going on. I sent him um, this footage here. The next one here is thermal drones. So this is the Azov Regiment showing operation of nighttime thermal drones against enemy targets in the Crimina direction. And I, I just said, look, I'm seeing a lot more thermal imagery and uh, nighttime attacks from the Ukrainians. I know this is previously the Russians had the advantage here, but last month's um, data looks like that advantage has shifted to the Ukrainians. And he just said, yep, a lot more advanced stuff is happening. Uh, the new munitions are having a large effect. Um, uh, and uh, as I showed you yesterday, he's just shown me the same video that I showed you guys yesterday, which is a drone going into a small uh, into a building, small smallish house, and the entire house blowing up from one small FPV drone. So the drone capabilities are I incredible. Um, and he, he says... The, the the march yet so he's just showed me his data i won't show you just in case you know he doesn't want it to be shown yet but we're looking like the nighttime drone advantage has shifted from a five to one russian to ukrainian advantage in february so that's you know 100 to 20 which he showed you last time 100 to 20 drone nighttime and thermal drone uh attacks Russia to Ukrainian and that has shifted to a three to one advantage Ukrainian to Russians and the Russian usage has dropped significantly by a fifth and the Ukrainians has trebled and that flip show is, is reflected uh, certainly anecdotally for me intuitively I am seeing much more uh, Ukrainian footage of thermal drone activity quite incredible so uh, not only is there a change in the scale from one side to the other in the amount of drones being used in particular ways but also there's been a change in the cap capabilities of these drones in their explosive power and putting thermobaric munitions on them and then we go back to the idea that who would want to be in this war? I wouldn't want to drive anywhere. I wouldn't want to walk anywhere. I wouldn't even want to sit in a house somewhere. I wouldn't even want to sit in a dugout because these drones are able to get you. It is it is a scary situation. Right, moving on. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on. On the night of April the 3rd, two explosions were heard at the Zhevskaya electrical substation in St. Petersburg. Uh, with damage to transformers with torn holes with a diameter of 10 and 20 centimeters characteristic of an explosive device 
Uh, it's been previously established that one of the transformers cannot be repaired. Okay, so this is interesting that we had a substation blowing up in Moscow a couple of days ago, and we've had a substation blowing up in St. Petersburg. It looks like these are not drone attacks. That would be kind of weird to just get a drone randomly hitting without being sighted a substation in these two major cities. This looks like it's some kind of partisan activity. And wow, this it could be quite effective um, uh, activity from pro-Ukrainians or from Ukrainians themselves deep inside Russia. Uh, substations getting taken out in two of the major cities of Ukraine is significant. And here we have the Russian Nevonomysky uh, Nevon Azot Petrochemical Complex in Stavropol Krai. Uh, catching fire yesterday, causing damage to several structures at the facility. Don't know what that's about, What whether that was a strike with... I mean, this would be more likely a strike with uh, a drone, but it could also be um, partisan activity. Um, the least likely is probably just a casual smoker, some kind of accident. But this kind of stuff is happening, and it will affect the ability for Russia to uh, prosecute its war, to just maintain a happy uh, and functioning society. Now, we're going on to strikes now. And just before we go on to the main news from last night, which I did a, a breaking news update on, it's important that we recognise that prior to that strike last night, Ukraine's military intelligence had hinted that drone attacks on military facilities in Russia were to continue as the and the range will increase. Okay, well, well that, that's telling you pretty much that, that something is coming there. And uh, it is, well, we, we saw evidence of that last night. If, if it wasn't necessarily with a particularly long-range attack, it was a massively significant one. So, as I reported, there was a, a, a huge attack on, uh, on an airbase uh, just to the west of Ukra uh, east of Ukraine, sorry. But also, there were, prior to that, reports of an attack on Kursk, and there was falling debris. It seemed like air defences were active there and possibly worked. There were fires throughout Kursk due to exploding um, munitions, I think, falling, uh, and general burning. Local authorities reported a drone attack, and the work of air defence fires broke out in several places. I don't really know the update on that today uh, because most of the bandwidth is taken up with the attack on Morozovsk Air Base in Russia. That's about 300 kilometres from the front line. If we look at it, uh, let's find it here, plug it in, there you go. So it's not massively far from uh, from the front line in, in Ukraine, not too far from the border. It's about 300 or so kilometres from the front line. So the the range of these drones that, that, that were striking at the airbase would be, you know, not the ones they're using at 1,200 kilometres plus, but there would be smaller drones and they'll be able, one presumes, to use a lot more of them, and that seems to be the claim. There were initial claims of some sort of 60 explosions or so. I don't think there were 60 drones, uh, but anyway, uh, there were many loud explosions there. Over 60 explosions have been reported, said the Ukraine battle map last night. The airbase is home to some 36 Su-34s and four Su-24 fighter jets. There are different claims as to the number and the types of jets that have been seen there. Uh, on April the 1st, there's no report. Satellite images show that Russia had 13 Su-34s and five Su-35s present at the military airbase in Morozovsk. Um, I could have missed some in this image, but the quality is not good enough to identify a particular one. So the reds are Su-34s and the whites are Su-35s. Um, I don't know how you tell that from that resolution imagery, so well done you. Um, but yeah, obviously they might have been, this might have been taken at a time when some of the, those planes were up in the air. Um, you might miss some, so on and so forth. Right, uh, so that's where it is and gives you a sense of, of the range of the drones that we used. Now, uh, as a result, that large-scale attack, and you can see there's footage of things exploding, there's footage of air defence working, and those air defences, interestingly, appear to mainly be um, sort of autocannons rather than rockets, missiles sent up. But I don't know, there might well have been pantsies and whatnot active as well. Uh, you just can't see them so easily. Anyway, large-scale drone attack on the airbase 
in Rostov Oblast uh, was a joint operation under Ukraine, SBU and Armed Forces of Ukraine. Sources told from Madska and Ukrainska Pravda, so two media sources, that at least six Russian warplanes were destroyed as a result of the attack. The claim cannot be independently verified. Um, as I mentioned, 40 to 60 explosions. Who who knows exactly what those explosions were? But yeah, the latest is that six planes were destroyed um, in that overnight attack and uh, another eight were damaged. Furthermore, about 20 Russian soldiers were killed or wounded, as the source said. Now, if that's pilots, obviously that's far more significant than, than just soldiers. So if there are any pilots who were killed in that, that's going to hurt the the Russians even more. Um, now, the eight being damaged, there, there is a claim here that they were heavily damaged. So six aircraft destroyed, eight heavily damaged. 20 military personnel were either killed or wounded. Uh, that, 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 if that's taken out of uh, play, 14 aircraft in one attack, that's huge. Imagine they can do that tomorrow and the night after and the night after. Imagine these other air bases. So we know that one of the biggest... Uh, challenges for the Ukrainians is the use of things like Kinjal, hypersonic missiles and other missiles and whatnot. Uh, well, if we um, if we try and work out where they are sent from, it's Saratov, the Engels Air Base there, you're thinking, okay, let's see how far that is. Uh, certainly further, that's now up to seven. So you, you want your drones, and we know that they have a number of drones that can fly up to 700 kilometers. They've got a lot can fly 700 to 1,000 kilometers. You, you're going to think Saratov is next on the uh, the list, really, because it 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 um it houses those two. Is it 295? The bombers, the heavy bombers that drop those uh, big missiles and uh, and cause so much damage to Ukraine. Well, what's interesting there is that um, several dozen suicide drones attacked tonight in Yeysk, Morozovsk, and Engels Air Base in the south of Russia. Right, it turns out that I think, well, the Russian MOD have claimed that 53 drones were eliminated by air defense systems on duty. 44 were shot down over the Rostov region. So the, the implication is that 44 drones were sent against that Morozov Air Base, Morozovsk air base okay 44 drones were sent and we possibly had the destruction or damage of 14 air airframes which is a great return on investment uh, like i shudder to think the cost of those airframes if you add them up compared to the cost of the drones so it's a really good useful attack um so six drones were shot over the krasnodar region so that's further down to the south by the sort of azov sea uh, Kerch Bridge area. Uh, one drone, one drone was destroyed over Saratov, Kursk, and Bel Belgorod regions. So the Russians are claiming that one one drone was around the Engels Air Base, basically. Now my thinking is, my speculation is that they are sending a dro one drone to Saratov, and the Russians do this. this. Is what they do. You get like nights of very small numbers of drones being used. You think, what are they doing? And they're just trying to sound out where air defences are, seeing the range of drones. Uh, they do this with missiles as well, seeing what can get where, and they're just building up an information uh, picture, like a information landscape of of what what they can achieve. So one drone to hit Saratov is telling you that they are sounding out Saratov. I think Engels Air Base will be next, uh, and that's hardly surprising, right? You take out the the Russian ability certainly in the short term, to use their aviation guided glide bombs on the front line by taking out the main base where they operate from. And then you move on next to their cruise missile and hypersonic ballistic missiles and take out that air base. You are slowly doing exactly what they've announced, which is Ukraine's military intelligence hints drones attack drone attacks on military facilitated uh, facilities in Russia is to continue and the range will increase. That's what they told you, and that's what appears to be happening. Um, so, Ukraine has attempted an attack to attack a Russian nuclear bomber airfield for the second time in a month, says Nexter. On the morning of April the 5th, a drone was shot down in the city of Engels in the Saratov region. So, there you go. That's where the 295s yeah, they, and 222s, heavy bombers, are, are located, and they fired the cruise missiles into Ukrainian territory. Well, 
yeah, I don't... Th you can call that an attack, and it is obviously an, an attack, but I think it's more of a reconnaissance or, like, range-finding uh, informational mission for that single drone. And we're likely to see see more to come. Now, the question for the Russians, or, or the problem, or indeed the dilemma for the Russians is, right, we know that Saratov's now going to be hit going forward. Do we just pull a load of air defences to Saratov? Where do we pull those air defences from? Do we risk pulling them from the Morozovsk air base because that's just been hit? But then you pull that to the the air defense to uh, to Saratov, and then Morozovsk air base gets hit again, and they take out the rest of the remaining planes that might still be there, unable to take off because the runways are damaged. Do they take um, air defense capabilities from elsewhere? You can bet your bottom dollar that the Americans with and, and the French and the British with their military intelligence satellites will be looking all over, pouring over satellite imagery to work out where air defense systems are being taken from. And you can bet your bottom dollar, if you haven't already bet it, that the Ukrainians will be thinking about, well, well let's hit there instead of Saratov. So it's just like baiting the the Russians into some kind of defensive activity that allows a weakness elsewhere or if they don't pull anything to Saratov they just risk it then Saratov is next on the list overnight Russia launched themselves 13 drones into Ukrainian air airspace and all 13 were shot down so that's a really good uh, interception rate obviously really good is 100% uh, fantastic news for the Ukrainians there uh, most of them or, or all of them possibly deployed from bases in occupied Crimea so again when you're thinking about military installations being hit by by drones it would be great to see these drone um depots and drone crews be taken out um as well right uh, ukraine battle map adds that russia is estimated to have about 108 uh, kh-101 cruise missiles remaining after launching 133 of them in the last two weeks russia has decreased the intensity and scale of the uh, x or kh-101 strikes and is expected to increase their usage of about 800 or so iskander m and k uh, caliber uh, kh-22 and kinjal missiles so they ha don't have a huge amount of the, of the missiles that quite honestly get sh shot down a little more easily. Uh, although they do have a lot of calibers, but that's possibly because they haven't been able to shoot them from the Black Sea because of the Sevastopol um, ship loading capabilities not being down in Novorossiysk. But now we're hearing that they've got the caliber cruise missile loading mechanisms down in their their new Black Sea Black Sea fleet base. So expect them to fire off the stockpiles that they will have of those calibers uh, relatively soon. But they're going to be concentrating on their ballistic missiles. This kind of M particularly uh, is a bit of a nightmare, very difficult to shoot down. And of course, the King Zhao's that they're firing in record numbers, uh, which is a new hypersonic fancy uh, missile that has had some success, uh, but has also been shown to be vulnerable to things like Patriot, we're not sure about Santi, maybe Santi as well. Uh, so I think every King Jal that's been shot against Kiev has been shot down. Uh, and going back to air defenses, the enemy have transferred, so the Russians have transferred most of their air defense systems from the Ryazan region to the front line and Crimea, according to the Atesh guerrilla movement. Atesh agents from the Russian armed forces report that they are facing a shortage of air defense systems in the Ryazan region. Uh, the military command is looking for ways to ensure the protection of military units, but understands that without air defense systems, they are defenseless. Wow. So that is really important because that's exactly what I was just talking about. So you've got the Ryazan region, which is up there. And this has been the site of a number of uh, refineries being hit there. Uh, and the claim that, well, we don't have the air defense systems to defend uh here they've all been sent down to the front line which tells you something so maybe they, they did have them and they don't anymore because the russians are desperate on the front line for air defense systems which means that when we go back to the air defense numbers from the ukrainian general staff figures again this leads us to believe that these are numbers are somewhat accurate the russians would not be needing to uh, Rob Peter to pay Paul down on the front line if they had uh, 
enough air defense systems. They don't have enough air defense systems because the Ukrainians have been attriting those air defense systems. So they're bringing them down from these places within Russia to the front line. And that means those places within Russia are now weak. So now Ryazan is ripe for the picking. And all it takes, for I, as I keep saying, this war is relatively easy to win. For either side, actually. I keep saying about Ukraine. Actually, it's the same for Russia. It's exactly the same logic. All you need is stuff. More missiles. More troops. Well, no, troops is a different one. Uh, stuff. So more missiles, more air defense systems, more infantry fighting vehicles, more tanks, more anti-tank guided missiles, more mines, more rockets, more, more, more. All you need is that, and the, the 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 side that has the most stuff and sustainably the most stuff, so that might include either allies or defence procurement or both. If you just can get stuff, lots of stuff, you will win against the side that can't get lots of stuff. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? The other component is a boots on the ground. So you need people to operate this stuff, right? Who has the deepest pockets in terms of stuff? and people. Russians have the advantage with people, but we might get to a point where the population is not happy with losing that amount of people. And that's different for Ukraine, because although they might not be happy, it's an existential thing. Like if we don't send our people, we all know because we're being we're the ones being attacked. So we know that, that we need to send our good people to defend our homeland, our families and our friends. Uh, and our culture and our identity that's not the same for the russians so they'll be drafted in pulled in to fight in a bat in a war they don't really understand and doesn't really have that justification that the ukrainians have and so there's a different dynamic going on with mobilization whereby you might get this afghanistan situation where the russian people are not happy to throw their loved ones into the meat grinder uh, and it's far exceeded what happened in Afghanistan. You can imagine that at some point soon, especially if there's a 300,000 mobilization coming by June, that the Russians are going to really start um, seeing this war as a, in a very negative light. There's only so much disinformation that the, the Kremlin can do to overcome like body bags. And if, if d you can say, well, OK, it might be a justified war, but actually it's not relevant for me sitting in my city in Ryazan or Moscow or Kazan or wherever it is you're living in Russia and your husband is coming back in a body bag. You're like, yeah, you might say this is a really important war, but Ukraine meant nothing to me like three years ago and it means nothing to me now. And now I've lost my uh, my husband, my cousin, uh, my nephew, etc., etc. And that, that's a very different scenario. So I think that the Ukraine can win this if they can sort out the mobilization and they can con consistently out um, compete Russia in terms of drones hitting very meaningful targets. So you, the Russians hit just all over this place within Ukraine. But if Ukraine can get the air defences to defend against their critical infrastructure being hit and at the same time do what they did last night multiple times and do what they have done to the um, to the oil refineries, then Ukraine can win this war. Now, let's move on to the oil refineries then because uh, we are seeing lots of data coming out concerning this. So Lukov's North Sea refinery, the fourth largest in Russia, has cut gasoline production by 40% due to difficulties repairing a broken unit. So not only do we have the more stuff, more people side of things, but then you have the ability to make stuff, and that's money, and the ability to generate money to keep your country afloat while also being on a war footing and making stuff. So y Ukraine has been hammered in its economy, but it's being propped up by NATO countries, the EU, 50 odd countries are supporting Ukraine with money, saying, OK, your economy's screwed, but here's money to keep your economy afloat and to build stuff. Who is doing that to Russia? So no one's doing that to Russia. And it's made worse by the fact that all of these nations over here that are supporting Ukraine are also generally sanctioning Russia. And they're doing it in a number of different ways. And sanctions are working, despite how difficult it is to keep them upheld, to keep the loopholes uh, buttoned down. Uh, sanctions are working. And R Ukraine is also hitting oil refineries, hitting Russia in the pocket. So this Lukov's North Sea refinery uh, has cut gasoline production by 40% 
due to difficulties repairing the broken unit. The only company capable of fixing it, UOP, withdrew from Russia uh, after the invasion. So this is coming from a Reuters article that's very interesting. Exclusive US sanctions hamper Russian efforts to repair refineries. Sanctions are working. They can always be better, but they are working. Uh, when engineers at Russian, uh, Russian oil firm Lukoil discovered a turbine had broken at the largest refinery on January the 4th, so this is going back some time, they quickly realised the problem was far from trivial. There was only one company that knew how to repair the gasoline-producing unit at the North Sea refinery, located on the Volga River, some 430 kilometres from Moscow. The problem was that the company is American, according to five sources familiar with the incident. The firm, Petroleum Engineering Multinational UOP, had withdrawn from Russia after the country invaded Ukraine in February 2022. Quote, they, the engineers, rushed around to find spare parts and they couldn't find anything, said a source close to Lukoil. Um, then the whole unit just stopped. Four other sources said that the unit, a catalytic cracker used to convert heavier hydrocarbons into gasoline, has been out of production since January and it was not clear when it could be repaired due to a lack of expertise inside Russia. The KK1 unit is one of only two catalytic crackers at the plant. As a result, the North Sea refinery fourth biggest in Russia, has cut gasoline production by 40%, according to two of the sources. Lukoil did not respond, obviously, for comment. The Lukoil refinery is an example of wider problems in Russia's energy sector, where some oil firms are struggling in the face of Western sanctions to repair their refineries, built with a uh, with the help of US and European engineering firms, according to at least 10 Russian industry sources. The difficulties have been exacerbated by Ukrainian drone attacks that have struck at least a dozen Russian refineries this year. The industry sources said the attacks forced Russian refineries to shut in some 14% of capacity in the first quarter, according to Reuters calculations. Wow. I mean, this is just having a huge effect. More important data. The North Sea refinery near the city of Nizhny Novgorod has a capacity of 405,000 metric tons a month of gasoline or 11% of Russia's total. So that one refinery, you take out 40% of 11% of the country, so that is something like 5%. Just that one refinery takes out 5% of Russia's uh, capacity for gasoline. The current outage would cost Lukoil nearly $100 million in lost revenues a month uh, based on an average Russian gasoline price of 500, uh, 587 per dollars per metric tonne, according to Reuters. Honeywell International Inc., uh, the parent company for UOP, said in a statement to Reuters it had not provided any equipment, parts, products or services to the refinery in Nizhny Novgorod since February 22, nor to the independently managed Slavyansk ECO refinery. The Slavyansk refinery was hit by a Ukrainian drone in March 18th and caught fire briefly. Quote, we are actively working to identify and interrupt any possible diversion of our products into Russia via third parties. This is what we want to hear. So Honeywell saying, right, we recognise that our parts can get to Russia by selling them to here and there and where everywhere. But when it comes to larger parts for refineries, it's not like small widgets, components that find their way into uh, ele electronic components that find their way into a missile. These are bigger like turbines or this or that, like large and very, very um, niche bits of equipment. It's probably easier for Honeywell to keep an eye on that. Plus, they would be given a load of pressure by the American uh, authorities as well. Um, anyway, uh, actively working to identify and interrupt any possible diversion of our products into Russia via third parties. The company said it complies with all applicable export license requirements, sanctions, laws and regulations. The US and its allies have imposed sanctions on thousands of Russian targets since the invasion of Ukraine and around a thousand companies have announced their departure from the country. Russia's export-focused $2.2 trillion economy has proved more resilient in two years of the to two years of the unprecedented sanctions than either Moscow or the West had anticipated. Western companies such as European Swiss engineering group ABB have supplied technology and software to all of the 40 biggest refineries in Russia over the last two decades, according to more than 10 Russian industry sources. Each refinery has a combination of Russian and foreign equipment. And the great thing here is that while... The, the West were providing uh, help, assistance, uh, components, servicing, maintenance 
for the Russian hydrocarbon industry over all that time, that meant that over that time, the Russians became dependent on the West for that. And as soon as that suddenly wasn't available, the, the Russians didn't have any ability to do that themselves. Their energy, they, we complain about our energy dependence on Russia in terms of the raw materials, but they've got an energy dependence on the West for the expertise and the technology and the components. So it's fascinating. Uh, Ukraine says it attacks R Russian refineries because it wants to undermine the Kremlin's war machine by reducing state revenues and cutting fuel to the army. Dr quote, drones are tens if not hundreds of times cheaper than the cost of repairs, which is almost in a war of important in a war of attrition, said uh, Vakulenko, who was a former head of strategy at Russian energy major Gazprom Neft. He left the firm and Russia days after the start of the Ukraine war. Russia was a, is the second world's second largest oil exporter. It has rerouted most of its crude. It's actually basic oil uh, in its crudest form before it gets refined into other products. Uh, it's been forced to cut fuel exports in favour of crude. So because we can't refine this stuff because we're getting hammered and we need to use it ourselves, we're cutting back uh, export of refined products, but we are exporting crude, according to more than 10 Russian oil traders. Russia su supplies crude to just a few large buyers, such as China, India and Turkey, but its portfolio of fuels buyers is comparatively broader as it can ship to smaller consumers without large refining systems in, say, Africa and South America. However, we are hearing now that India is stopping doing an awful lot of buying of Russian crude. Go and check out um, uh, Joe Bloggs, uh, the videos that he's he's now again pumping out on his, his normal channel as he has it back from the hackers. It's really good news. Now, there are so many ways that Russia is being hit in this war, basically on a, on a front in terms of equipment, in terms of people. And then those people are being pulled out of working in the economy. So there's now a labor shortage and that's having a really important effect on the economy. And then it's being sanctioned and then it's having drones hit oil refineries and crude oil exports infrastructure you add all of this together and the sanctions then hurting with regard to the UAE, China, um, India and the buying of hydrocarbons. And you you get a sense that really the screw is somewhat turning on Russia. Uh, and I know it's all woe, woe is us for Ukraine. And, and we've, we've all had a, a difficult couple of months in trying to get our heads around what's going on with the war and how it's been looking bad for Ukraine in terms of uh, supplies. But actually, Russia is in a really precarious position, I would wager. Now, the media has said that NATO considers the Russian offensive in spring unlikely. NATO intelligence data suggests that Russia is unlikely to launch a large scale offensive in the near future. Uh, that's because they've been hammered and look at their loss rates. Now, this is in direct uh, contradiction to what the Deputy Secretary of State in the US, Kirk Campbell, asserted yesterday, I think it was, that Russia has nearly fully rebuilt its military after Ukraine invasion losses, a statement at odds with the Pentagon and the EU allies assessments, and indeed NATO now. So what is going on with Kirk Campbell in with the US State Department? Now, he's either just wrong, just completely erroneous and irresponsibly you know, communicating incorrect assertions or he's wrong but knowingly wrong and the State Department is doing a psyops here and so it's actually disinformation um, purposefully or he's correct and everyone else is wrong. Uh, I think the last one is is unlikely from, from what we are all seeing uh, so it's either psyops or just ineptitude and I just can't work out even I can't work out why what there's no point doing a psyops if no one else is playing that psyops game. So if NATO, the EU and the Pentagon are not agreeing with what you're saying, I, don't, I just don't get it. And tatragami has gone and then said, well, Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell has recently stated that Russia has almost completely reconstituted its military. Front Intelligence Insight, so that's who he, he works with, has diligently observed Russian forces, their composition and available resources. We would like to share several important points, he says. Um while it's true that Russia is constantly rebuilding its forces and trying to replace losses, including recruiting new personnel and creating new units and military districts, the reality differs significantly from what appears on paper. Front Intelligence Insight has closely monitored 
sorry, just uh, need to get that up. This closely monitored multiple Russian units and noted a problem that has become more apparent since 2023 and continues to worsen in 2024. Armored losses are being replaced by civilian vehicles such as vans, pickup trucks, and other unarmored vehicles. Uh, we documented evidence of the replacement of T-72 tanks of various modifications with T-62 and T-55s and at least one tank unit. While we don't know the situation across all units, occasional videos of T-55 and T-62 in different areas suggest this is not an isolated case. According to Oryx, since the start of the invasion, the number of lost vehicles has surpassed 15,000. As of around 2024, um, uh, the 24th of March 2024, including 2,856 tanks, 135 helicopters, 106 aircraft and 20 ships. Russia cannot replace such numbers within two years, despite the Soviet legacy. In fairness, Russia still maintains an advantage over Ukraine in terms of replacement and substitution, as Ukraine has received minimal replacement since 2023, and its domestic production, while improving significantly, still lags behind in meeting frontline needs. Despite suffering losses in land, naval and aerial vehicles, Russia has seriously expanded its drone Arsenal, potentially one of the most numerous in the world, consisting of hundreds of thousands of tactical reconnaissance, suicide and bomber drones. Yet, newly formed units don't get vehicles per their organisational structure, sometimes resembling rifle units more than motorised or mechanised units. Furthermore, during the Avdivka battle, the newly formed 25th Combined Arms Army had to transfer its equipment to the 2nd and 41st Armies. Considering the above, Russian forces went through transformation, acquiring new drones and electronic warfare capabilities as well as valuable experience, while also suffering tens of thousands of vehicle losses and the loss of experienced officers and soldiers. Uh, it will take Russia multiple years to rebuild its army. Moreover, given the experience of the invasion of, of Ukraine, its post-2022 forces previously organised in uh, battalion tactical group units will look very different. The future, size and composition will depend on the outcomes of this war. In other words, Kirk Campbell's talking bollocks is the TLDR of that and uh the question is why I don't I don't understand that anyway uh, President Zelensky has emerged from a defence meeting to tell Ukraine things are stable on a front. Russia cannot advance. This is big and it might not be wholly true, as in they are still advancing, but I don't. I think what he's really saying is they're not advancing in the way that they were at the beginning of the Avdivka uh, advance when they actually overcame the Ukrainians due to the Ukrainians' lack of ammunition and the use of aviation. Well, now we have ammunition coming through and aviation might be uh, impinged by the sorts of strikes we saw last night on Morozov's, uh, Morozovsk Air Base. And so there, there is this idea. I mean, uh, we have seen the northeastern axis unmoving for well over a week, probably two weeks now. Uh, some some small advances in Terni Torska, but the Russians have lost masses of, tr uh, of equipment. They've lost masses around Abdivka, Tonyenka. They've lost masses around Novomikhilivka uh, and, and other places around there. It's just... I think you will see grinding uh, gains in small areas on the front line, but at huge losses. Um, and I, I think really that's what he means by they cannot advance. Yeah, might be a, a 500 metres here, a couple of tree lines there, but not the sorts of advances we saw when they took Avdivka. Um, in today's Russia, and that's amazing, That if that's true, and if, if that is what what is going to be the case then that's massively significant. Steve Rosenberg, BBC reporter who's done such a marvellous job out in Moscow, said in today's Russian papers, Russia's opponents depicted are depicted as forces of the Antichrist and Russia is described as a country chosen by God. How Moscow views, views the world right now. This is a really interesting positioning. And we've seen this, well, actually we've seen this for a long time since sort of, I remember there was uh, articles I wrote back in 2017 on the back of the humanist uh, no, um, the uh, New Humanist um, magazine had some really interesting articles on how Putin had co-opted the church to, you know, um, talk about traditional values to get conservatives on board to to inspire nationalism and ultra nationalism, and that's a vehicle he's using to f to underwrite his imperialism. And they are going with it. And actually, interestingly, this is this is obviously here for the domestic audience, right? The, the This is playing very much to the domestic audience. But when you look at the Russians, they aren't actually the God-fearing folk that you think they are. So the statistics on their church attendance is very low. But when, interestingly, this does play well 
internationally with particularly in the American uh, Republican Orthodox Christian uh, not Orthodox, but um, uh, fundamentalist Christian, evangelical Christian movement in America. Look at this and say, look, America, uh, sorry, Russia has these traditional Christian values. This is a country that we want to support. And that's, they are getting some support from the US through that way. In fact, recently, a uh, an evangelical family uh, moved from Canada, I think it was, to Russia on the back of this kind of information, disinformation, I think, in, in a sense. And they realised it was terrible and, and they were screwed over and it wasn't the place that they thought it was. Um, but there is this definite messaging from within within Russia that they are this traditionalist Christian nation and uh, that they are fighting essentially a holy war here. Um, although I would argue that Ukraine is possibly more religious in a sense that, and I've been there and I've experienced their religiosity and I've written on it, um, and I say that as an atheist philosopher, that, that they have a more genuine, actually, uh, religious spirituality that, that infuses through their society. And it's not, it's, it's, it's quite, it's a very different style of religiosity than you would get, say, in, in, in evangelical movements in the US. And, and I, I would suggest very different to, to what Russia experiences as well. So it, it's, it's interesting that they call this, you know, they see this as a kind of holy war. Right, going on to my uh, other favourite subject, which is Elon Musk. This this is fascinating, by the way. So Elon Musk has said Twitter has begun a global purge of bots and trolls about time from the system on uh, as social networks traffic hits an all-time high. Now, he said he was going to do this when he took it over, and one of the reasons he didn't ta almost didn't take it over and then was f forced to take it over because he had entered into a pre-agreement agreement, agreement so he, he got cold feet and he said, I'm not going to take it over because you can't tell me how many genuine uh, users you have and how many are bots and trolls. And that was one of his arguments for not taking it over. Then he was forced into like a $40 billion acquisition or whatever. And he said he was going to clear out the bots and trolls and it didn't. And indeed, what happened is at the beginning of the war, just look at this data. It's absolutely phenomenal. It, at the beginning of the war, this, so this is the beginning of the war in Ukraine. What happened with organic traffic? Traffic went nuts, right? Uh, and it's actually had a huge increase in traffic. But that traffic is almost certainly bot traffic on the back of Russia getting involved in a war and trying to um, trying to manipulate the narrative. And finally, he's realised that so many pro-Ukrainians. And I can tell you this myself in my, with my own experience, but so many pro-Ukrainians on on Twitter have been complaining about the masses of bots, about deleting, like as G J and Kiev said, 250 to 400 bots in a single day, like deleting, blocking them and blocking them. Well, now Elon Musk is, is taking action. But at the same time, he's also got involved in the whole NATO debate about Ukraine. Ukraine's entry into NATO will be the beginning of a movie about the nuclear apocalypse, according to Elon Musk. So he says, this is literally how the nuclear apocalypse movie starts. He wrote on Twitter under the post with a video of the speech of the US Secretary of State Blinken and Foreign Minister Kuleba, during which a head of State Department and the, uh, said that Ukraine, quote, will become a member of NATO. You know which side this man is on. And it ain't Ukraine's. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in there for you. It's been a bit of a bumper day. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Take care. Speak soon. Toodle pips.